Welcome to this UNEP Plus debate on Europe's migration crisis presented within the Citizens Corner concept. The debate is produced and hosted by UNEP Plus and HRT Croatia, a member of the UNEP Plus network. The debate can be followed live in the European Parliament on our UNEP Plus Inside website, on our Facebook profile, as well as on Twitter using the hashtag Citizens Corner. I'm Brian Maguire. Joining us today to discuss Europe's migration crisis, uh, Tanya Fayon, MEP from Slovenia and Vice Chair of the Social Democrats European Parliament, Scott Keller, MEP from Germany and Vice Chair of the Greens, Helga Stevens, MEP from Belgium, Vice Chair of European Conservatives and Reformists, Malin Bjork, MEP from Sweden, Vice Chair of United Left, and Aspasia Papadopoulos, Senior Policy Officer at the European Council on Refugees and Exiles. We're also joined by students from our university campus networks, Andrea Pancho from Zagreb University in Croatia, and Elsa Julia Sanchez from the University of Vigo in Spain. Welcome to all of you. Tanya, let me ask you first, let's deal with some basic facts. This migration crisis is a mess, isn't it? <laughs> Um, I wish to say no, but it seems that we are quite in a mess, or I would say European governments and our leaders are making a mess. Because what we are discussing today, the, the refugees, uh, the war victims or the violence victims, people that are coming from Africa or Middle East to Europe, the numbers are not much higher than we were used in the history, but we were able or capable to deal. Today the situation is different. We have a lot of nationalism, we have a lot of populism. And this is reflecting the situation when we discuss today how to distribute um, the numbers of refugees. It is not a dramatic situation, but of course, when we talk about migration on one hand, we have to talk a holistic approach. This is how to assure legal ways to Europe, how to avoid that people are dying in Mediterranean. But on the other hand, the, the first reaction to show some solidarity. It's not a problem of Italy or Greece or Malta, but it's a European problem. We have to help each other. Okay, Scott Keller, has the European Commission given the necessary leadership in this or have they really got the message wrong? Well, I would say that the Commission has taken at least some small steps in the right direction. Now, for example, proposing an emergency distribution key, which I think is is certainly a step in the right direction. Sure, I would like to see more. I think we have to address the, the roots problems more, like the changing the whole Dublin system, which currently requires people to ask for asylum in the country of first entry, or dealing with um, safe and legal ways of entry, because that is a main problem, that people who are in need of protection have no possibility to have a safe and legal way to the European Union to ask for the protection that they are entitled to. So I think there are some major, major problems, but we know that the member states are blocking the heads of states, the ministers, they are blocking. So I think in this case, I mean, the Commission sure could go ahead much further, but it's very clear that the problem this time is with the member states. Madam Bjork, how do we shift the member states uh, on this policy? Well, I think that uh, today we have a situation with 28 member states that have to agree on, on some of these measures. And I can just, just conclude that they are not agreeing. And I don't want uh, a number of member states to, to be held hostage by nationalists and, and, and racist governments that don't want to agree to uh, taking a greater responsibility for the, for the refugee crisis that we have in our neighborhood. So I would like to see a coalition of the willing to go uh, to take a step and to, uh, to lead by example. Because if uh, we cannot agree on 28, maybe there is uh, an enhanced cooperation possible, maybe there is other means to go forward. But what is not an option is to not find a solution. Then I think Europe is failing everyone. Okay, Helga Stevens. Helga's using uh, translation here, uh, so maybe a short gap. Helga, the issue uh, in terms of how we develop a policy with member states and which is coherent, what do we need to do next? Well, of course, different member states have their own problems to deal with. Focusing, for instance, on Southern Europe is what we're doing now. But Eastern Europe also has their own immigration problems, such as the Ukraine, Albania, and Kosovo immigrants. The Council needs to take a broader view. All of the mem mem member states need to try and cooperate. But I think we also need to take a broader view and look at other refugees in the East. And look also at the distribution key. I think it's a good step forward, but it's not weighted correctly. For the weighted system, the 10% of asylums, the 10% used for um, asylum seekers already 
making applications in our country for Belgium is too low because we've taken on so many immigrants. It's not sustainable at this point, so we have to find a good balance. Also, one of the hard parts is how do we see who needs the actual asylum? If we have irregular economic immigrants, that is a problem, and we need to see the difference between actual asylum seekers and irregular immigrants. Okay, uh, if you have any answers to those questions, I'm happy to hear. We'll try and get some during this program. Aspasia, when you're dealing with refugees and exiles, what what do you see in terms of integration? You, you represent a, 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 an umbrella group for uh, groups which have uh, direct action on the ground. What do your members tell you they need from, from the member states? In terms of integration? Yes. I think at the moment you see uh, quite a divergence between member states. The different conditions, the different opportunities, the different integration prospects, and of course the different welfare systems. And that is that is pretty normal for different member states to be the case. However, what is what is creating problems and obstacles is the fact that uh, that the status is not uniform and that people do not um, really enter the same types of um, procedures and conditions in different member states and that's why they move around. Um, at the moment we need, uh, what we need is, is really a different system in Europe that will basically um, cancel the need for people to go and move around except for family reasons for example, that they can have the same opportunities to grow and prosper and settle permanently in different member states. Integration needs support, integration needs financial assistance, integration needs um, proper um, also uh, participation and active participation of all stakeholders in society. Everybody needs to be involved, the schools, the churches, the NGOs. And of course, support is somehow limited when it comes to integration. You see that, for example, even under the financial support by the European Commission, there is integration included in the national programs, but member states often tend to put more money on other measures. Tanya, when we look at these figures, 20,000, 40,000, you can add 20 more if you want to because they're going to come. But in the UK, for example, there are more than 200 cities with more than 100,000 people in them. And if you take the quota allocation for the UK, about 2,400, for example, and you put them across 200 cities with more than 100,000 people in them, you're, you're less than 10 people per city. How can we not manage to integrate that number of people in Europe? This is exactly the question that was raised um, when we discuss integration. Because we create maybe a bigger social problem if we take people in the country and then we close them in some military or other complex out from the cities and we keep them disintegrated. This is, I think, then really a social problem that's happening in the countries which today have the biggest burden, like in Italy. And of course, people are afraid. People, I our Europeans, I can tell you a discussion in Slovenia. We got a number 700 people. And uh, we have a, a, a very difficult discussion because firstly, people don't know who is this refugee. They are afraid. They don't talk about it. And if we look, you mentioned communes in UK. We have 22 communes. If we would distribute, would be two and a half people for one commune. It's, it's nothing, but the question is whether we are willing to make a program to give them possibility to learn the language, to give them a chance to have a work, to really integrate them in the society. And if the governments or all levels, local, regional level, are not able to create programs, how to integrate them, then we will have a social problem. And I think we are capable of doing it, but I believe that there is really not a right political will in Europe. Okay. Malin Bjork. Yeah, I, I find it have difficult enough to find two people in a restaurant or cafe. If I go into never mind in a whole city. So how can we not do this? And, and what is it? What's wrong with the messaging? Our society is basically racist. That this is nothing to do with reality, nothing to do with economic facts. That this is just a racist issue. Well, I, th I think that we do have. You know, the agenda has been set, been set wrong. I think the questions have been asked wrong, and the paradigm has to change. I think, you know, people speak about burden sharing. Maybe it would be more reasonable to say, what, what will Europe do to share the responsibility for the refugee crisis? We do have a responsibility. It's our neighboring countries. These are people that are fleeing war and conflict. So that should be the paradigm starting point. And then from that, you will find, you know, then you have, get, 
di get different priorities. We need to save lives. We have to open up legal ways to come, come into Europe to, to seek asylum. We have to redirect resources for the integration and reception processes. And, and that way, I think we should frame this much more in a positive way. Uh, the other option is that Europe closes itself in on itself, and that leads to uh, a kind of uh, Europe that we have known in the past, okay. and we don't want that again. Victor Orban, Scott Keller, it's not uh, two names you see in the same sentence very often. The <laughs> Victor Orban would love to see Fortress Europe. Would, uh, would you agree with them? Not at all. I mean, um, Orban has drawn up a questionnaire in Hungary on refugees. Now, you can always ask your population, you can ask also about migration issues. That's not the problem. But the problem is how you phrase questions. And if the questionnaire goes like, would you agree that people uh, should be uh, deported or that people, that migrants who usually are criminals should be done this and this, then you very much frame it in a certain way. And I think we indeed, we should not try to close Europe's border or for example, thinking that if we don't rescue people in the Mediterranean, then less people will come. I think this is just creating a lot of tragedies and a lot of catastrophes. Rather, we need to be sure that there will be refugees coming because there's such a great need. If you look at Syria, people have been living in the neighboring countries in, in winter, in snow, in, in mud for four years. And it's not a surprise that now they say we don't see how this conflict is ever going to end. And therefore, we're now taking the final step to go ahead. So there is refugees for very good reasons. I think what we need to be doing is to, to deal well with these people, to support the communities that take on board refugees, to also con try to convince people that it's, uh, that it's a good thing to take on board refugees, that they're an asset for our communities. And sometimes I wish I would see the, great, uh, the, the same amount of, of effort and zeal of the Commission goes around uh, fighting for TTIP to fight for the rights and acceptance of refugees. Because you see, you know, if you, if you think something is right, then you should also try and explain this to people, not always say, oh, we can't take on board the whole world. The whole world has no, no wish to come here. It's about refugees refugees that are very much there and if we look at the global situation most refugees are in much poorer countries like Pakistan, Lebanon, they have a real problem. We're talking about very small numbers okay. and I think Europe should be able to deal with those. Helga Stevens, the refugees I've spoken with here in Belgium uh, from Rwanda for example, almost all of them want to go back to their own countries. All the ones I've spoken with. and. You give, have given some good examples in the past about how Belgium has integrated uh, refugees, migrants within the system, using education to, to integrate them and raise their income. What best practice do you think Europe needs to learn to integrate migrants into Europe? Well, when it comes to integration in Europe, we all need to set up a program of support for integration for refugees, yes, but you have to understand, that, as you said, many refugees want to go back home. So at the same time, it needs to be realized that there are many people who they don't want to stay, and what we need to think about is if there's any way for them to go back home to install peace in their country of origin for the children so that they can have skilled training, life training, and are able to actually contribute to society are the very important parts of integration for society as a whole. But as you said before, we, we need to be more permissive about immigration, but I believe that because of the wars in Africa, the poverty in Africa, it's really important to work on solving the problems that are located in those areas to make more long-term solutions so that people can stay in their homeland, in their own country, with their own families and communities. Just two weeks ago, I went to visit Jordan to an encampment where a lot of Syrian refugees, thousands of Syrian refugees are there, and they want to go back home. And so the question is how, and that is the responsibility of the governments of those countries as well. And we need to okay. fix the corruption problem. We'll there bring as well. in uh, our students now as well. Do you have questions for our panel, Elsa? Okay. How can the the, the migrants' original countries help prevent immigration? Aspasia. 
I think we need to recognize the fact that the majority of the people reaching Europe right now are refugees. They're fleeing for the life, they're fleeing situations we haven't even imagined. And they will do so no matter what. And what they need to get here is a safe and legal way to do so. They will do it illegally if there is no legal way, but what we can do is open up legal channels for them. There is resettlement, but there are also other ways like humanitarian visas and the possibility to seek asylum by the embassies, for example. What the countries of origin can do, well, they're fleeing the very same countries, so there's not much they can do. They're just trying to escape those countries. We want and need to address the root causes, the conflicts, the instability. But this is long term. This is not going to happen tomorrow. But do you see any sign of this really at the moment uh, as part of a holistic strategy, a really long term, solid direction for Europe and in its foreign policy element? But if you take Syria, for example, there is substantial support by the European Union in Syria in form of humanitarian aid, development cooperation. There is plenty of that. But still, there won't be any solution tomorrow. And there are 4 million refugees hosted in the neighboring countries. There are only 250,000 Syrians that have reached Europe. 5% of all Syrian refugees have reached Europe, which is nothing. The only thing we can do right now is just to help those vulnerable people get here. And yes, many would want to go back, but they won't go back next month and they won't okay. go back next year. So, okay, somebody's got to pay for this at some point. Either we do it now or we do it five, ten years' time and we have to deal with more complex situations within the European territory and not in the Mediterranean or on the African side. Do you think there'd be more political will for a coherent package of support for African countries uh, and to, to build uh, humanitarian camps like Turkey has done at the moment. Turkey's done incredibly well with less than, than two million people. Is this the change of direction that we need to see which would gain the money and the political support? Indeed, we need to look at the root causes and there is cases that are more problematic and difficult to solve like conflicts like in Syria. I mean, there is no easy way out there, but there's other things that are uh, more straightforward to do, for example, if we look at uh, the European agricultural policy that is causing much harm in other countries, where we're taking away the livelihoods of people, or same with our fishery policy, or with our trade policy, and that is quite disruptive uh, to developing countries. So in that area, we can do a lot with changing our policy, so that wouldn't cost us anything, maybe, and that would actually well, probably save us money in terms of agricultural subsidies, for example, um, but that will be less disruptive for other countries. So in that sense, we can do a lot about uh, reasons for why people are on the move. In other cases, like wars, it's much more difficult. And um, certainly development uh, cooperation has to play a role there, um, but also political coherence because for example if you mention agricultural policy then that's something that is decided here by the agricultural committee and do they look at um, the issues that might be raised in the developing committee so I think also the European Parliament has a role to play to ensure greater policy coherence in the interest of development. But when you look at uh, Angelo Alfano yesterday uh, speaking in, in this, uh, just across from, from France and Ventimiglia saying we can't deal with these people and we're going to let them run across your country if you, you don't sort this out. Is it not cheaper for European money to be spent in Africa, in, in uh, areas in the East as well, to build businesses rather than have them come, have the, to process them through uh, asylum camps, to have to house them, to have to treat them through the, the bring them through the, the legal system as well, and then deport them. Is there not a better investment in a, a larger development budget? But how are we going to invest in Eritrea or in Syria? I mean, that's just not possible. That's not going to stop anybody from fleeing a war or a dictatorship or uh, from uh, from forced uh, military service okay. and things. There, you can't do so much with developing cooperation. You have to, of course, in get politically involved in, in solving the crisis. Yes, we have to do develop cooperation yes we have to make sure that other countries um, or especially people uh, can see a perspective in their own home region but that takes long and we have not been doing so for the last decades and we should not forget that we can also not expect from people to say look I give up my personal perspective in order to create a better perspective for my life I mean I'm from a region of emigration in East Germany people went across to the West and looking for better jobs and it's very difficult for them for for me to tell them for example look you should stay home because that's going to be better for the regional development because they know exactly that it might be better for the regional development but not for the personal okay. development well immigration works for Europe if you look statistically at who comes the contribution they make 
they immigrants do not migrants do not uh, take from European society. They contribute. Why is this story so wrong? Well, as I said, I, th I think we are we're getting it wrong. I, it, it's like you say, in f one does the only economic calculation. These are contributors to our societies in all ways. Uh, I mean, economically and in other ways. But we have, we are, it's as if you know the, the, the extreme right, racist, nationalist agendas are gaining ground and derailing the debate and derailing the, 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 um, the discussion. And I think uh, also the fact of, of trying to address the problem where it is the root causes in the, in the countries of region people are fleeing from, it's also a little bit derailing away from our responsibility. What is our responsibility and what do we need to do? It's not going away tomorrow, so what will be our answers? Yes, it should be legal asylum ways, it should be saving lives at sea and, and uh, uh, ensuring a decent reception and, and uh, hosting societies. Tanya, last week uh, you tweeted, I think it was from Budapest, saying about wake up Europe, uh, I think it was the hashtag, and you said that migration is not a security issue. Is that really true? Um, that is as well uh, many politicians or many people want to derail the debate and connect it too much with the security issue. Because um, I don't think it's right and we have no proofs really that um, between the migrants there are direct links to terrorists. Uh, if there is, th there is certainly not, even if you read uh, the latest Frontex report, you don't have a direct link. So this is a very, very, I would say, dangerous debate if you go that you direction. You could say of the terrorists as well, they're going to come anyway too. I mean, terrorists, then we can simply close down our borders. Is that what we want? Because there, the terrorists can come, I mean, no matter when. We have Schengen, we have common trust we built for years in Europe. And this is now a threat with the nationalist and populist um, rhetorics, which I believe it's really causing a lot of damage in our very vulnerable society. And when we discuss about the responsibility, I wanted to, to say before, we have to bear in mind that for many crises, we Europeans are responsible as well, that people have to flee today. And we have the problem in Europe, the refugees are here and they will be still coming. If we now close our eyes, we will create even a bigger problem if you don't find a solution. And just to mention still before you ask whether we have enough mid-term or long-term solutions, I think in the last proposal of the Commission, though I very welcome the, the, the key distribution and the, uh, the immediate or um, short-term um, measures, I think they didn't address enough the long-term and um, solutions. I think we have to do more how to help people not to flee the country. It would seem to me that the, the easier political approach is actually to deal with the long-term solution first. That is what <laughs> actually the, it's happening now. If we, if we see the reactions of the European governments, it's exactly going this way. We have to address the root of the crisis. I think first we have to address the lives. We have to bear in mind that the numbers we are talking today, that behind each number, it's a human life. And this we have to help first. But of course, in a broader context, we have to address everything. Yeah, I, it strikes me that more people have died in the, the last three, four months in Europe and Mediterranean than died in the Titanic when it went on. And yet we can easily clarify the tragedy of the Titanic and we can easily forget what happens in the Mediterranean. Helga, what's wrong with our messaging in this? Why can't Europe's politicians convince their citizens that they have a real responsibility? I believe all European citizens do have a responsibility. But because of traffickers, we also have a responsibility to, to address that because they're the ones that put them on the boat. We are not, there are citizens and we are not the ones that put those people on the boat that put them in danger in the first time. And, and they've actually been pushed across. Those people can pay three, four, five thousand euro, euro in advance for a, sh a, a, a ship. That's a staggering amount. So the question is, how can we save human lives without supporting trafficking, human trafficking? This is the question. Okay. Europe already is looking for Ways, ways to solve this problem, but the question is where does the responsibility stop? 
Okay. Does it, is it at the shores of Lebanon? I mean, in Libya? Where is it that it stops? Alan, this uh, Tony Abbott, Australia's Prime Minister, he's taken to paying uh, the traffickers to turn their boats around. Should we do that? Definitely not. I think this is another example how we are rerouting the debate. Uh, we're saying instead of speaking about the responsibility we have, how we will we, we'll, we'll host more refugees, how we will save lives in the Mediterranean, we start to speak about how are we going to stop them from even coming here. And then the, all the fault becomes the traffickers. They have a business because we have no legal ways to enter into the EU to seek asylum. And to, I think that was one of the most shameful conclusions in the Council when they said we're going to out to shoot the boats uh, in, in the Libyan waters. I think that shows a little bit uh, the, the scale of the problem when it comes to the country. It worked with the pirates though, Tanya, didn't it? They, they, they did it off the coast of Somalia and they took out the, the motors with snipers. And we don't have much of a pirate problem. Can we do the same with traffickers? Certainly, the wrong move would be to make a military action, which I think uh, would cause only I further instability and even harm the refugees. So the target would be definitely wrong. But I wanted to answer your question before why we are failing in Europe. I really think for politicians, it's the most unpopular topics and politicians try to survive their mandates. And they simply are not brave enough to come today and go for, go face people with the reality and be brave enough to say we have to help. It's a very unpopular discussion for, for politicians today who try to really fight for these migrants. This is the reality in okay. Europe. Let's bring our other student in uh, again now as well. Andrea, you have a question for the panel? Sky, are they going to stay at your house? Well, I think we should do everything that they will accept this distribution key. I think it's high time for a tiny little bit of more solidarity. I mean, the distribution key that is on the table is a very small measure. We're talking about 40,000 refugees here. So I think uh, that, is this, that is what we should fight for. The well, message me yesterday sounded quite optimistic. Yeah. That is also well, let me just ask you this. The Commission is really messed up on the messaging in this. They Had they done their homework properly, they would have when Federica, when Federica Mogherini went to the United Nations, they mixed up asylum and uh, economic migrants as well and said nobody would be turned back, which technically is not correct. The asylum, uh, those who are entitled to asylum should stay, but economic migrants would have been returned. And then they put out the quota as well, the, the distribution list. And had they looked at what the UK was capable, was already doing, and reduced the threshold a little bit, UK would have said, we're fine, we'll do that. We, you know, we're, is the commission just not doing its homework properly? Well, I wouldn't think so. I mean, there is uh, a lot of uh, pressure from um, the countries where they that have the main arrival points. And the Commission is trying to find an answer to this immediate problem. They're looking at what they have as at hand with the legislation. Um, and uh, what they have is uh, the temporary um, protection directive, which gives way for emergency measures. So I think that is certainly, I mean, I'm saying it's, the, it's a small step in the right direction, but at least it's finally going in the right direction. Too long we were going in the wrong direction with this military actions, for example, because I completely agree that doesn't help at all. So I think now, since we finally took a small step in the right direction, we should push for it. And we should also indeed uh, point out that this that we also need to th think a bit more long term about how we change the whole Dublin system because it is unfair both to member states okay. as well as to refugees. So we should really fight for this one. Especially, what if we call our military intervention humanitarian support? Does that change the dynamic a little bit? I think it's a joke. I don't think this can be ever a humanitarian operation. This is an operation that is military in its conception. It shows a wrong understanding of how smuggling works because basically most of the arrangements are ad hoc. It's fishing vessels that are just used the night before. We don't have an army in front of us to shoot at. So I think this is actually just a wrong understanding of the way migratory flows work right now. There are of course all sorts of criminal um, networks that profit from that and they might be trafficking all sorts of other things including goods and then of course you always have this kind of interlinkages but this is not the way to address it and the collateral damage that has been hinted in the proposal to me is a moral um, catastrophe if actually Europe engages in anything that could basically throw people into the water as a result of this operation this is a shame for Europe 
Daniel, you've been working on the security documents as well with the S&D, and you're dealing with ISIS. ISIS is not remote from this. ISIS is now in Libya. It's not got access to airports. It can, it's controlling a large part of the smuggling network as well. It's making a profit from us. This is becoming more of a security issue. To believe that um, ISIS people would be traveling uh, through Mediterranean no, in but boats. No, they, but they, they are controlling. I think it's a joke. Yeah, huh? but they're controlling this and, and gaining more control over the traffic networks as a source of revenue. That certainly is a risk, especially what is happening uh, with, uh, within the human trafficking in the Mediterranean. But once again, to, to connect with the terrorists, I think we should be more afraid of Europeans that are born in Europe, that are educated in Europe, and that become radicalized and decide to go to fight to so Iraq and Syria. do you Syria. think this, this scenario has been used by certain parts of the political... Certainly, this is... What's the their objective? Are they trying to build a European army or are they trying to just close borders? I think uh, if you look what legislation we have at the moment in the table and what is coming in with all the discussions on PNR, um, smart borders, uh, changes of visa code, everything goes into the direction that you have a feeling we are creating a fortress Europe. We are closing slowly, step by step, down the borders. And we are gathering a lot of data of people traveling and data that is not maybe necessary or not at least balanced uh, or efficient uh, with what we try to achieve and uh, basically creating that every traveler that is coming to Europe is already a potential suspect um, as well exchange data with the police or uh, enforcement agencies this is what is happening and I think the, the focus on the security is absolutely not balanced with the reality what is when we discuss the migration issue. So is this a, an, a perfect opportunity for the security network to, to expand and itself? It's perfect and not only for security as well for, 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 uh, for industry that is developing um, super machines to control travelers and investing a lot of money. So it's as well the, the capital money issue. Helga Steams, do you agree with that? Yes, in part. But one of the biggest problems politically is how we see the difference between asylum seekers, as I said, and illegal economic immigrants. Because the data that we've seen shows that in um, Somalia and in Senegal and in Syria, that's what we're getting. Almost 40% of those immigrants should be sent back. And um, we're being asked to absorb all of that migration in Europe. Asylum seekers from wars, yes, absolutely, we should bring them. But um, the amount of illegal economic immigrants at this point is so high. Of course, in Europe, we do want to cooperate. And we all have to try agree on some sort of system. But we don't want to make human traffickers rich in the process. Malin, the after Second World War, it took five or six years for the population to settle back into their homelands again to begin to get a solid reconstruction. So in this discussion about the migrant crisis, we don't have a narrative which says we can actually achieve something within five years, within 10 years, which looks like a stabilized society again. Why is that? You mean here in, in uh, yeah. the European context? I think that the we were sp speaking about the little steps that are being actually taken now with the relocation mechanism, with, with, the, with the resettlement. Uh, they are actually, the numbers are too low, but that's, that's another issue. I mean, in the case of Sweden, it would mean that we would take less than we currently do, which I think would be unacceptable. So uh, that, that's another point. I think we, we, uh, we are moving towards um, a situation where we have to uh, have, uh, people are settling, they're integrating, and I think, Different countries have different plans for that. I think if we put as much resources into building a future together, together in Europe, uh, as we put into militarization, into building a fortress Europe, we would largely have enough to actually resource the reception and hosting of migrants. And I met a, a Syrian family having traveled very dangerously with their little kids, one year and five year old, from Turkey to Greece, and now they had to travel uh, onwards towards Sweden because that's where they were, their family were. Okay. So they have family in Europe. This is their place. We have a question from Facebook from Giorgio. who says, why should Italy carry uh, on all the migration of Europe? These migrants don't want to, to stay in Italy. Why the other EU country, countries uh, can't accept to help us? 
this political narrative is running away. It's a, uh, you know, the, the pace at which the member states and the commission are acting is far behind the sense of frustration and fear within the member states, particularly in Italy at the moment as well. And part of the question which we hear a lot is, how can we afford more migrants when we can't even employ the young in our country as well? First of all, Scott Keller, how, how do you convince people to take in more migrants in Spain, in Italy, in Greece, when youth unemployment and general unemployment is so high? Well, the, the scheme is exactly to help Italy and, and, and Greece. Um, but I still think that Europe, as one of the richest regions in the world, has to do its share to help people who are fleeing from, from war, from persecution. I think everybody in Europe will understand that. I have met so many people who are not rich at all, but who are saying, yes, indeed, those people are fleeing and we want to help. That is, I think, that's, that shouldn't be questioned because that is also our responsibility. Nevertheless, of course, we also have to make sure uh, that we uh, we address issues like youth unemployment, unemployment overall, the whole economic stagnation that we see. Migration, of course, also is good for economy. Um, I mean, refugees are coming because they have to go, but overall we see that societies that have a lot of migration, that are open, are doing much better economically, and uh, those migrants are often creating a lot of jobs. So this is not a contradiction, migration and economic. Uh, possibilities and prosperity, they rather often go hand to hand hand. You have lots of people who come and who are full of force to create a new life, a new livelihood, and I think that can also be used by the member okay, states. Especially your network as well. What do they tell you about uh, the response that they get? If you, can you explain to people that these are not economic migrants, they're running away from war? Do people on the ground understand that difference? I think people do understand. <coughs> and I think there are also procedures in place. And I think also over the last few years, since actually since Lampedusa in 2013, there is a significant um, coverage in the media of stories, of human stories. There is a much better understanding nowadays of what people are going through and why they're leaving, what they, what they go through uh, to get here and, and what, it is, what it is like when they arrive. Um, I don't think this is the problem as such. I think it is the rhetoric that is employed at political level. And the rhetoric is that we cannot deal with migration, we don't want migrants, we want to close our borders, which is fairly hypocritical. Because if you just look at the situation in the labor markets, even in countries that are facing um, significant challenges, the migrants really do not compete with the nationals for the jobs. It's so convenient to have people clean the floors and pick the tomatoes and oranges in the Mediterranean and take care of your growing mother and your children, but then at the same time you say you don't want migrants. It's just so convenient to do so. Um, the majority of the people do not compete with the nationals for the same jobs, and that is a fact. At the same time, there are also very highly skilled people that arrive using the same channels, there needs to be opportunities, legal opportunities for them to get here as well. And for all this, what you need is a comprehensive policy that allows people to get here legally, that supports them upon arrival and for the first few years, that gives them a chance for a viable future. Okay, Helga, final opportunity here. Your message to the Commission, what should it do next? Well, the Commission should find a solution with the Council. I think that Europe will lose face if they don't find a good, sustainable, workable solution. Okay. So I suggest that they look at asylum seekers and in cooperation share with other different member states, take a bigger, broader picture, not just of South Europe, but of also the eastern borders and look at different countries and what they have done so far in the past with asylum seekers as well. Belgium, Germany, and Sweden have taken on so much of that responsibility. Okay. So that's my answer. Okay, each of our, our other panelists as well, in 10 seconds, what should the commission do next? Melon. They have to focus on saving life and opening up legal ways for asylum, and they have to support the countries uh, that are willing to take a greater responsibility for the reception of asylum seekers. And uh, I think the militarization of EU borders must immediately stop. That's the wrong route, and the mixing of security issues with migration is completely uh, unacceptable. Sky Keller, Commission should do what? 
In addition to what Marlene just said, um, I would add that the Commission should stay strong on the distribution uh, key and make sure that solidarity is respected, that all member states um, agree to this uh, mechanism, but that also to addition to, in addition to the solidarity with member states, we also add solidarity with refugees. Spazia. I think in addition to all this, because this is pretty much a lot of it, um, there needs to be substantial support for reception right now in the Mediterranean. Greece and Italy are facing a humanitarian crisis. The islands in Greece are facing a crisis and there will be more of this. Okay, Tanya. <laughs> It's not often that we are supporting the Commission so clearly, but <laughs> this time I, I, I agree. They should really strong defend the distribution key and not withdraw it. And finally, it's a test for the whole Europe. If we fail this test, then I think we should stop saying hypocritically that we are defending human values. Okay, thank you. I wish I could have brought our students in a little more, but we're, we're out of time now as well. So let's just do a wrap up the summary of what we discussed today. Safe and legal uh, ways to Europe uh, must be addressed. Uh, we can't be hostage uh, to the root causes. We have to direct some of our attention to solving that for the longer term as well. Not just looking south to the Mediterranean, but looking east as well to, to the Ukraine and uh, to Syria and Iraq. The distribution key, the waiting, the Commission has got to stay firm in this, our panelists as well. Uh, we need a uniform uh, statute for, for integration, uh, a benchmark for integration, how to do it better. Our responsibility as Europeans is not just about uh, tax tackling numbers, tackling economics, it's also about values. We've got to have our values first and maybe the, the policy will fall directly in behind that as well. The long-term strategy has also got to include how we deal with traffickers. We're looking at the criminal side of this, the integration of security elements as well, but not to overplay the security element uh, as a, a geopolitical uh, approach to uh, the defense industry and the data industry as an opportunity. We're dealing with people, not facts and figures, and the terrible stories that we hear coming across is not just a matter of economic migration, it's a matter of asylum. And if we've learned nothing from the last 70 years is that there is a way forward. There is always a bigger approach. Europe needs a better understanding and more vision. Let me thank our panelists today. Tanya Fayon uh, from Slovenia, Scott Keller from Germany, Helga Stevens from Belgium, Malin Bjork from Sweden, Aspasio Papadopoulou from uh, the European Council of Refugees from Greece also, <laughs> and from Andrea uh, Pacu from uh, Croatia and Elsa Julio Sanchez from Spain also. Thank you all, and uh, this has been Euronet Citizens' Corner Debate.